Welcome. We are really excited to have all of you here today. We have uh, a bunch of great speakers here. The right. industry experts here. Join the meeting. We are here with the Compost and Research and Education Foundation and the United States Composting Council. We are here talking to you about specifications and why to use compost under a Stop grant Warren. from Join the, meeting. the EPA Region 3. We have, as I said, a great lineup of speakers, and I want to remind you, please mute your microphone. We have Frank Franciosi from the U.S. Composting Council, and uh, myself, Hillary Nichols, Donald Pearson, Greg Evangelo, and Dr. Brig Britt Fawcett. I am the first speaker. What we're going to cover today is your challenges. We did a survey. We asked you what your challenges were, what practices you currently use for specifying compost and specifications in general for erosion control, um, stormwater management, and growing plants. And we, we want to talk today to you about what those challenges are and how we might be able to help you address some of those. At the end of this webinar, we're going to remind you that we have a follow-up uh, webinar for your state where we can help facilitate the, the city and the state talking to each other as well as compost manufacturers will be there to see what we can do to help you solve your, your problems with comp and you do it through compost. Uh, we're also going to talk about how compost can help you today. We're going to go through example specifications, both the templates that the USCC has as well as what other states around you are doing and around the United States. Um, we're also gonna talk about compost BMPs and compare them to traditional BMPs. So, so who do we have here with us? Uh, please enter your name and your state in the chat along with what agency you're coming from. We sent out the invitation to departments of transportation, departments of environmental quality, and people from all over the, the spectrum, from design to planning, installation, and maintenance. Uh, so we really are excited to have a well-rounded discussion about solutions and problems. Um, it's really important to make sure that design, maintenance, and installation are all keeping in close communication with each other. And also folks from the, the state to the county uh, to the national le level and the city level. We know that keeping communication open between all of those is very important. One of the items that we heard from all of you about the issues that you're facing is how specifications may be different across those different levels from state to county to city and how beneficial it would be if those specifications were similar between each. Uh, so we're gonna go through the, the survey responses that you gave just general overall. And as we go, we would like for you to ask your questions in the chat. Gary Oceans is going to tabulate the answers live and bring up questions to speakers as we go, as, it, as necessary and occasionally. And then at the end, we'll go through any questions that we didn't get to uh, initially. So some of the, the survey responses that we got we hear from you that the current specs don't necessarily address the issues they're meant to address. And that's really unfortunate because specifications are meant to be templates to help everyone get to a good outcome. So that, that sounds like a really big issue. But sometimes you're, you're telling us that it's difficult to find compost that meets those specs. And we're gonna talk about that some later on um, if they're, if there is any compost manufacturer that you would like to join the STA Certified Compost Program, just let us know and we can try to help uh, get that person into the program. We are also hearing from you that there's not enough communication between departments about the needs for specs and we're going to help increase that communication. Um, other people are concerned about the environmental impacts of other BMPs having a lot of plastic. 
and you're concerned that your specs are out of date with current research. And we're gonna present some new research today. Um, so you also had some questions for us. And through the, the course of this presentation, we're gonna address a lot of these. We're gonna talk about price and expenses. Uh, we have uh, Donald here, who's gonna talk about his real world experiences with decades in the North Carolina DOT. And then we also have Britt, who's going to go into some research uh, about different uh, BMPs. So we've brought together a lot of great experts to show you uh, solutions to some of the problems that you're, you're identified. We also heard from all of you that there's some concerns about phosphorus leaching. So that's why we have uh, Greg Vendelo on the call. He's an expert in that, and he's going to tell you all about it. Um, So some other concerns that all of you had, um, not all compost is created equally. Uh, that honestly is why we have the SCA certified compost program. So you can compare the qualities of different composts. Uh, and we're gonna talk about calculating percent organic matter. Uh, we've heard from both composters and uh, specifiers that, that is, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. So we also loved hearing from all of you what you appreciate about compost. It's really great to hear all of these wonderful benefits reflected back at us because when you hear from consumers about what they love, that's when you know that's the thing to hone in on. So we heard from you that it's a natural resource and it diverts waste from landfills and that, that's great all by itself. Even before you talk, start talking about the benefits to soil, providing nutrients for plants, water holding capacity, soil structure, you all are seeing it and you're telling us about how wonderful compost is. So we appreciate that and we wanted you to let your peers know uh, what you're seeing. So we're gonna go through um, an hour and a half presentation as well as question and answer session here and the take home statements that we wanna make sure that you hear is that compost helps your soil soak in water and over the life cycle of the product, not just the initial installation costs, compost costs less. Uh, we also want to help you with our template specifications here at the US Composting Council. So that, with that, we'll go to our first speaker, Frank Franciosi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Frank Franciosi, I'm the executive director of uh, both the U.S. Composting Council and the Compost Research and Education Foundation. Um, it's great to have everybody here. It's great to be talking about uh, compost use, uh, particularly on, on areas that are in desperate need of organic matter. Uh, compost, is, it's, it's pretty uh, blunt. Um, it increases your, your plant growth of better soil, better plants, um, let, uh, greater survival rates when you're looking at in the landscape for transplants, um, better sustainability. Um, and then uh, when you're looking at stormwater runoff, um, you know, better water quality uh, issues, uh, and then also um, better air, air issues, air quality issues too. Next slide. So what, what happens uh, when we have uh, development, we have increased hard space, um, and if you look at in nature, uh, the forest uh, floor is a nice layer um, of organic matter, um, deep topsoil layers where you have increased infiltration uh, from rain, less runoff, um, and you have more evapotranspiration with uh, the vegetation. And then when you look in the microscope into that organic matter, you see a lot of good biological activity from invertebrates, vertebrates, and as well as, uh, as the microbiome of soil, which is really important when you're looking at um, the extreme conditions that you have, uh, particularly off highways where you, you don't have any organic matter and you have deep cuts and you're into subsoil. Next slide. So if you look at, um, particularly around urban areas, you have increased hard space between roads, um, driveways, patios, roofs, um, you have more runoff. And with that surface runoff, obviously um, you have uh, um, silt, you have uh, animal waste, you have um, pesticides um, all in stormwater runoff, particularly in parking lots, you have oil sheen um, and all of that. You have increased runoff because you have less infiltration and less evapotranspiration. 
Uh, and if you were to look at some of the soils, you would see that those are void of uh, really good soil biota. Next slide, please. So if we took a cross section of soil and pretty much any of the states that you're in, um, the O, A, and E horizons are pretty much removed, uh, particularly in highway areas um, where you have disturbed soil. So you're left with clays um, or uh, mineral-based soils um, that are void in organic matter. The important thing to note here is that, that those top three horizons um, is really where all the, the biological activity, the cation exchange happens, where plant and root, root growths uh, um, happens and where you have exchange uh, with nutrients into the plant. So if you're void of that, um, you're void of, uh, of really that kind of good biological activity um, within the soil structure. Next slide. So what are the benefits when you're looking at compost and green infrastructure? Um, the obvious ones are um, increased water infiltration because you have, uh, you have better soil texture, um, you have organic matter that's holding the water, which is really important, particularly in areas where you have drought or you don't have water and you're just depending on mother nature to, to water um, your plants or your, your grasses. Um, you have less um, particle dislodging because you have more aggregation with the organic matter. Obviously that um, is reduced runoff. Um, compost, when you're adding compost into the soil, uh, it does have a buffering capacity to the soil. Uh, so where you have uh, acid soils, um, you have improved benefits there from a chemical standpoint. Uh, and then also it filters and binds pollutants as well, which I talked about earlier about stormwater runoff, particularly in areas like bioswales um, and green roofs. Next slide. So there are uh, uh, the benefits of compost are physical, chemical, biological, and other. And those are the, the, uh, the categories that they fall in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, physically changing the structure of the soil uh, and also holding more moisture, um, buffering the capacity of the soil uh, and stabilizing the pH, uh, increasing the cation exchange capacity. So um, when you have higher levels of organic matter in the soil, um, you are increasing that cation exchange capacity. So you're, you're, the plants are more available to uptrake nutrients. Um, it does, compost does supply some nutrients, get into that later. Um, but I think some of the more important things are um, the increased soil biota. Uh, and then also it does have a benefit to suppress, suppress plant diseases, um, as well as bind uh, nutrients and contaminants. Next slide. So when we're testing composts, you know, what should we be lo looking for? Um, you, you want a compost that is, uh, that is stable. Um, it's uh, basically mature. Um, it has been aged. Um, it's not heating. Um, nutrient content is going to vary depending on how that compost was made, the feedstocks that it came in with, um, how it was blended, how it was mixed. Um, but a good percent, percentage of the nutrient content um, is in a slow release form, uh, as well as a plant available form too. Um, so you do have some residual effect there. Um, we want something that has a high organic matter content, 50 to 60% is ideal. Um, you know, low moisture content, mainly for trucking and transportation purposes, as well as application. Uh, you can't really do really good job of spreading a wet compost if you get up over that 50% mark. Um, Increased water holding capacity is really important. Again, as I mentioned, uh, when you're looking at both stormwater runoff and infiltration, um, pH should be about neutral or slightly acidic, or it could be slightly alkaline. Um, soluble salts, no greater than 10 millimoles per centimeter. Uh, a high percentage of the salts in compost are nutrient-based salts. Um, and then you want, again, a lower bulk density. A lot of that has to do with how it's screened um, and also um, uh, the moisture content that's in the, uh, the, the material itself. Next slide. So I mentioned salts. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that um, in some compost, particularly ones that are high in nutrients, um, you are gonna get uh, mineral salts um, that are coming from those nutrients. 
Um, you know, you do not want um, high sodium salts. Uh, NaCl um, is something uh, that you don't want in a compost. But I think when you look at composts, you can get a, uh, a salt index um, <clears throat> a test run on these to see how that breaks out. Um, a lot of these are also leachable as well. Next slide. So this is the definition of compost. I'm not going to read it verbatim. Uh, the Association of American Plant uh, Food Control Officials uh, made this an official uh, definition in 2018. Um, and I think it's important just to note that, um, you know, you have to have a heating effect. It has to be, um, it has to reduce pathogens. So most of these have to meet a PFRP, uh, which is the, a process to further reduce pathogens as explained in EPA uh, standards. Um, a lot of the state requirements for compost um, use that as a standard. Um, you want something that's stabilized, that's mature, um, that can be used as both a soil amendment or also possibly as a alternative because uh, it does for fertilizer because it does contribute some plant nutrients. Um, and then again, it's screened based on what the end use is going to be. Uh, you'll see that in compost blankets, it'll, it'll be a coarser particle size. If you're using it for planting, um, it'll probably be a finer uh, uh, particle size. Next slide. So how is it made? Um, compost can be made from various different feedstocks. Um, the important thing is that you, you, you create a recipe based on those feedstocks. You try to keep your moisture content um, between 50 and 60% when you're starting out. Um, and then you want that uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 or 30 to one uh, carbon to nitrogen. Uh, you want a pile that is that has a lot of porosity in it because you need the airspace for the microbes to maintain uh, the being aerobic. Uh, and you know, composting, depending on the technology that you're using, um, you could speed up the process by adding air and pumping air or pulling air through the pile. Um, anywhere between uh, 21 to 120 days. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there is a time and temperature um, requirement based on what state you're in uh, to make sure that you're maintaining temperatures of 131 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. So in that process, um, you are reducing any detrimental path pathogens that may be in the original feedstocks that are coming in. And then as far as curing goes, we want to see compost aged, you know, between two and six months, again, depending on how it's made and the feedstocks that were coming into it. Next slide. So what are some of the raw materials that are used or as we call in the industry feedstocks? Uh, Biosolids, uh, animal manures, um, a lot of yard waste and wood products, and pretty much all uh, compost facilities require carbon and need that, uh, that uh, feedstock to maintain uh, the porosities within the piles, uh, as well as provide uh, carbon available so it breaks down. Um, could be made of pre or post-consumer food waste. We're seeing more and more of that. Um, industrial byproducts coming from uh, food processing plants, pharmaceutical plants, uh, various types of industries. Uh, and then really anything that is an organic byproduct, um, you know, from animal mortalities to slaughterhouse waste, um, could be used um, as in raw materials. It will break down if it's uh, managed properly uh, and it's composted uh, by professionals. Next slide. This is where I introduced Donald Pearson. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Frank. Okay, everybody, greetings to uh, all those attended and uh, greetings to my um, DOT uh, folks across the Northeast. I have a kinship with you as I'm a recently retired uh, DOT employee with North Carolina. Uh, just in the last couple of uh, months, I have made a, a transition after 30 plus years and uh, primarily was in the environmental compliance uh, arena for DOT infrastructure in the Piedmont uh, part of the state. And so uh, welcome, and I hope that uh, we can squeeze as much info in here to generate lots of questions and uh, uh, discussion with you so we can follow up maybe next week or uh, later. So we'll go ahead and get started. Wanted to 
just um, tell you, like Frank said, or build on what Frank said about working in the B and C horizons, North Carolina, it's no different. We are uh, probably building highways in soils that were uh, not even seen by the dinosaurs, I suspect. And so the fertility is uh, inconsistent. We might get lucky through our seeding efforts and with our amendment, soil amendments uh, to maybe get a little bit of a jump start for our vegetation, but uh, odds are it's an inconsistent fertility. And so with that, we end up with some uh, long-term struggles. We may get that immediate jump in the first six months or a year of, of uh, trying to establish permanent vegetation, but long-term we may see the turf just fade due to fertility. And so it's been probably 10 plus years when uh, Frank and some vendors uh, and some contractors in North Carolina came to visit uh, DOT and asked if they could um, offer some alternatives to improve our efforts in establishing permanent vegetation along the right of way for our infrastructure projects. Um, and, and many of you DOT folks may be familiar with uh, sometimes the right of way ends up being a research ground for a lot of uh, alternative uh, methods or the uh, interest in, in wasting materials. We've done everything from poultry litter to uh, hog waste to municipal sludge to ground up pallets for ground cover. There's been a variety of things tried. And Join the meeting. I think originally the compost element kind of got lost in that. So it took a while for it to get some traction. So the next few slides I've got kind of give some case studies of uh, my experience in using the compost uh, Material, we refer to it in North Carolina on DOT projects as a compost seating, a compost blanket. Um, but in this case, you can see this is about a 30 foot cut uh, through a sandy loam soil section, Piedmont of North Carolina. Um, we did a traditional seating effort. And as you can see uh, in the bottom right here, we, we our seed mix and what we used, uh, our, um, our efforts were good. Uh, to begin with, but over time through the project, it faded, and you can see uh, kind of what we were stuck with. And this is not an uncommon site on many of the cut slopes uh, through the state in construction. Um, I talked to, uh, I think, one of the vendors that uh, the contractors that Frank had mentioned in our earlier meeting, and they wanted to do a demo. And so they came out and did about 3,000 square foot, about 10 cubic yards of compost, just blew it right over the existing conditions. We didn't do any preparation. They used a uh, pneumatic uh, system. So it's a truck that actually has like a large fan wheel that blows this mulch through a hose onto the ground uh, based on some conversations with the U.S. Composting Council and the, uh, um, and the contractor. We get about an inch uh, overlay of what was there. And you can see the, uh, after we put that, uh, got that compost on the ground, this is kind of what the results were. And then in just a couple few months, we started to see some results on the slope and to this day, uh, we still have good stabilization and some of the desired uh, species, primarily Ceresia lespedeza has generated on this slope and now we have permanent stabilization. Um, just a few miles from that uh, previous slide was a, uh, another project we had with a different um, soil type of clay, a silty clay type soil that red uh, common soil to the Piedmont, North Carolina. This is along uh, another interstate project where we're building and widening, adding some lanes. We built a noise wall, as you can see in the lower slide uh, along the back. Uh, we had some trouble with traditional stabilization efforts. And so the geotech uh, engineers wanted to try this thing called the platypus anchor system, which is, if you're familiar with that, it's driving this, um, this unique uh, rotating head into the soil to a certain depth and then backing off, putting torque on it and creating these cones of compression on the slope to kind of hold everything together. And they used a product called Pyramat, which is a three-dimensional uh, turf reinforcement product that requires some infilling if you're gonna use it for uh, traditional ditch uh, stabilization. Well, they use it on this slope. We put about an inch or two inches of compost over the top of that product. Uh, the unique thing here is there was no access directly. So the truck is on the other side of this noise wall, uh, traffic is on the lane. So we did have to do some traffic control. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But we used the, um, we used the truck to uh, blow this, this compost over the wall and down through this tube. We applied it on the slope. And as you can see what it looked like after we finished and the results of, um, 
of vegetation becoming established through this. Now, in this particular uh, site, uh, I tried something different. And for some of the states, you may be familiar with polyacrylamide, which is a uh, product we use uh, primarily in North Carolina to uh, address turbidity. Uh, we use it in some of our um, BMPs to kind of create that um, uh, binding of silt particles with the polymer chains in this polyacrylamide. And as the sediment gets heavier, it falls out of suspension. I used it on this sloop by broadcasting it with a shoulder spreader uh, to try and create a little bit of, um, of a Rain-X effect, if you're familiar with that product on the market, to kind of shed some water, uh, limit some of the uh, saturation that compost may have had from rainfall, just to see it as a trial. And it seemed to work pretty well. So you can see the results after application. Here's another example of a um, constructed floodplain we did, again, about five or 10 miles from the previous two locations, again, in a very clay soil, we dug out and expanded some floodplain for a bridge over a jurisdictional stream and wetland combination. And we tried to uh, get creative on this project and use compost blanket or compost seeding as our primary ground cover effort. So we, blow, we blew the uh, compost out with the pneumatic blower truck in a similar depth, maybe one to two inches over the floodplain all the way up to the uh, end vent and the, uh, the slow protection with the stone. In the bottom slide, you can see what the results were. In this case, we used a native uh, vegetation mix, seed mix of some uh, natives, which if you're familiar with using natives, they are slow to germinate. They need to go through a chilling cycle, cooling cycle to break dormancy. So we included a temporary ground cover. So some rye grain was added to that. But you can see that we did get good development, and I'll report to you now that this area is full of needle rushes, uh, bull rushes, and some other native uh, wetland species to the area. So we had good success in that regard. So this slide, and we'll expand on this a little bit um, because I know there is an interest in what is the cost versus traditional seeding and mulching um, versus compost seeding. So in North Carolina, we have a um, we pay for the process for seeding and mulching. We do not pay for results. We pay for the process. And so in that case, you're getting a, a seeding and mulching effort. And if you compare the cost of just seeding and mulching to compost seeding, you can see based on 2019 bid prices, it's not comparable. Um, it's difficult. But I don't know that compost seeding is for every seeding effort. And so usually, if you compare it to places where you have to use a rolled erosion control product or a uh, erosion control matting, and you start adding the cost together, you can see the compost seeding um, essentially is cheaper or extremely comparative uh, in, in price and cost. And so it's hard to compare it to just regular seeding because I don't know that you're going to get results unless you think about, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. If your fertility is bad and you just keep seeding it traditionally, eventually, I guess you'll throw enough lime and fertilizer into it to make a change. But compost seeding is a one-time direct application. So some positives and some negatives. Cost is in both. Uh, and I put those in quotation, but they're in both because it depends on the way you look at it, the way you use the compost seeding as to whether or not it is... Um, cost effective. But the compost application is a direct application. It doesn't require, at least not in North Carolina, you may look at your state's environmental uh, quality group to see, but we do not have to put a ground cover on top of the compost because the aggregate that exists in compost is enough to hold it in place. So we can apply it and it is the ground cover. So it satisfies the MPDES permit requirements as well. We use it in areas where there's an accessibility challenge um, and so along railroads, if you've ever worked with the railroads, you know that there is some sensitivity to how close equipment gets to it. We can apply this from the top down and get some stabilization. We use it in some jurisdictional stream, floodplain, new locations to try and get a, uh, a soil media that can accommodate growth of vegetation. And then sometimes, as you can tell, we just repair failing slopes throughout uh, the right of way and uh, it's a pneumatic truck that can carry 40 to 45 cubic yards of material, and you can just do some repair seating in places as well. But there is a requirement to do some stockpiling and some storage if you have a lot of quantity on your project. So things for you to consider. You need to sit down and give some consideration to what 
uh, what you're trying to accomplish and talk it through with your roadway folks, your structures folks who are on your projects in the pre-construction phase, and maybe even talk to some contract subcontractors who would do this application so that you can identify where you would put it. Do you want to do the initial seating? Do you want to just supplemental or repair areas along your right-of-way? Uh, where, where is the truck going to be able to park? Uh, what kind of traffic control is necessary? Do you need safety lights on it? Do you need the crash truck, the attenuators to protect the individuals? I will say that discharge from the truck is pretty quick. So if you have a rule in your state that says you can uh, work on the shoulder for 15 minute, 20 minute increments, you may be able to unload a truck in close to that time in some areas. If you're going to have a lot of material, you need to provide a stockpile or a supply somewhere on the project to cut down on that back and forth for those trucks. That could be a cost. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, make sure you've got the certification and that'll be discussed in some other presentations. We talked about safety requirements. Think about the depth too. Uh, you don't need four inches of compost if you're just putting it on top of the soil to grow grass because maybe an inch or two is enough. As that material breaks down, it's gonna leach into that material, that subsoil material and only improve it. And so over time, you're gonna get an improvement in the subsoil you're growing vegetation in. Think about the application method. I wouldn't encourage you to just take it out there with trash cans and dump it on the slope and rake it. Use a contractor that can uh, distribute it through a pneumatic blower truck. Uh, seeding it, you can seed it in a, bolt, a variety of ways. Uh, some of the, 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 the trucks are outfit with a seed box that distributes the seed in the hose as it's being blown on the slope. Some contractors will whirly bird it with a shoulder spreader after it's been applied. Give some consideration to how you want to do that. Think about how you want to pay for it. You want to pay for it by the square yard, by the cubic yard, by the acre. Make sure you're giving some thought to this as you're building your, your provision or your contract document. And then make sure that once you do it, if you do get heavy rains and some scour or washes, make sure that you put contract language in there that says repair is incidental so that you aren't having to uh, pay an additional fee to bring the contractor back and uh, do work on those slopes to, uh, to, to, to fill in those scours or those washes. And Hillary, this is my last slide, and then I'll be turning this back to you, so be prepared. But this, this is just a comparison and a reminder that as you're thinking about compost seeding versus traditional seeding, don't look at it as a equivalent. They are not equivalents. There's so many more benefits to using a compost seeding than a traditional seeding, but one of them is the cost is not the same. But when you have to include uh, an erosion control matting cost on top of a traditional seeding cost, then you're going to get a comparison that makes compost seeding much more attractive, especially when you aren't having to add limestone or fertilizer because compost already has those built-in um, nutrients to it. So I know that was very fast. I apologize for rushing through it, but I want to make sure we do get to the next, the next speaker. So Hillary, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing this and turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Donald. So you mentioned the seal of testing assurance program, the STA certified compost program. So I'm gonna tell you about that. Um, once you've decided that compost is what you wanna use on your slope, uh, you need some labeling of your product, right? Because not all compost is the same. There are different feedstocks in it. They, after it's composted, you get different qualities. Like Frank mentioned, Sometimes it can even be just what's the moisture content of the compost so that you can use the blower truck that Donald mentioned. So you need to know those qualities about the compost that you're gonna purchase. And that's where the Seal of Testing Assurance Program comes in with the information disclosure and standardized testing. Uh, we're gonna help you out with that. So the purpose of the program is to increase your customer confidence in your compost selection that if you're gonna go out with a blower truck, you know what to expect uh, with the product that you're getting, how much fertility you're gonna get out of that particular compost, they're all different, uh, and whether or not you're gonna be able to utilize that compost the way that you want to. So this program is gonna help you figure that out for that product. I, I wanna emphasize that the seal of testing assurance program does not mean that it's wonderful compost. Uh, we do believe that compost is wonderful, but 
you know, every compost is different. You may need a coarser compost for some erosion control efforts. You may need a finer compost to be applied on turf. And so you need to look at the test results of your seal of testing assurance compost to verify and see which type you have uh, so that you can get the results that you want. And that's what we're proud of about the uh, seal of testing assurance program is that you're gonna be happier with your results if you're careful about which compost product that you purchase. So what else, what else does the seal of test insurance program do other than just test compost and, and disclose those test results to you? Uh, we check on composter permits to make sure that they're complying with government regulations. We understand that that's a key point that many Department of Transportations are looking for. This is already in your rules and you have to go and check those permits. So we're trying to make your job easier by doing that for you before you purchase a material. Um, also, organic matter is not all compost. Frank mentioned uh, compost needs to heat up enough that it destroys a lot of those pathogens and weed seeds. So we require that any compost in our program must meet our definition of compost. Um, and it's not just disclosing the test results that we require. It's also the feedstock ingredients um, so that we can disclose to you what those feedstocks are so that you can make your own choice about which material you want to purchase. We also require that all of our compost manufacturers have recommended directions for using their products because like I mentioned earlier, not all compost is good for every application. There are different types of compost that are best for erosion control or turf use or other uses. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're helping you be satisfied with your purchase. Um, also, I'll show later on uh, the test results. It's, it's not just test results for each one of those different parameters. We also compare your specifications against the test results of the composter in front of you on the paperwork that we provide in this program. Um, so when you are looking at test results, you want to make sure that you can compare one compost product to another compost product, apples to apples. And that's what this program does. We standardize how composters sample their, their material to make sure that the results are going to be accurate that you're provided. Uh, we are working with the Standards and Practices Committee of the, the Compost Research and Education Foundation to continually update our test methods for testing that compost, which we call the TMECC, TMEC methods. Uh, we also test our labs three times a year against each other to make sure that those labs are proficient at running their tests. You know, you want to make sure that there isn't a new person coming into the lab that's a little shaky on the on the how to run the test. So we test those labs three times a year, and composters are required to use the labs that we've double checked. Um, and we don't test compost in every single batch that goes out the door. That can get to be cost prohibitive. And we know that that cost would get passed on to the consumer. So we've decided that for people that produce one to 6,250 tons, we're going to require that compost manufacturer to test the material every three months and on down the line. Um, if it's a compost manufacturer that produces a lot of compost, it's gonna be monthly testing. So we wanna make sure that you're looking at those test results and noticing when those test results came from. Are they within this time period? You wanna make sure you have recent test results and that you are provided with a history. That's one of the benefits of the seal of testing assurance program is that you're not just getting a one-off test result in order for somebody to get a bid. You're also getting a history of test results so that you can see over time how, how they've been doing with producing that compost. Is, is there some variability? There's going to be variability and how much it varies so that you can make a good choice with the product that you choose. Um, so once you get those test results, what, what's required for passing those test results? For the seal of testing assurance program, you need to pass uh, heavy metals and pathogens to the EPA limits and disclose all the other parameters so that, like I said, you can make your own intelligent decision. The U.S. Composting Council also has another program called the Consumer Compost Use Program that has acceptable ranges for more parameters. So uh, that is for flowers and vegetables, lawns, and trees and shrubs. 
So that becomes a little bit more of the standard for a compost product that some of you might be looking for. Uh, this is the example we have of our compost technical data sheet. And it shows that in the middle column, that's what your spec is. Whatever you tell us your spec is, we put that on the sheet. And then underneath that line that says example, that's where we put that particular compost manufacturer's test results. So you can compare line item by line item. What's going on? Is this going to meet what you're looking for or not? And you see that on the back page are the compost manufacturer's suggested directions for use and the ingredients of that material. There are a lot of different beneficial ways to use compost. So I mentioned earlier the Compost Consumer Use Program. These are some of the specifications that the U.S. Composting Council has written for our suggestions for what the test results should be, how you can apply that compost in establishment situations as well as maintenance situations. These are available on our website. We also have suggested template directions for use for compost blankets and berms and socks. So make sure and check out our website for those suggestions. We put a lot of research into making sure that everyone is going to be happy utilizing those. So one of our general uh, recommendations we have is the strive for 5% organic matter in soils. And this is meant to be across all different soil types. Every 1% of organic matter increased in soil increases the water retention of that soil by 27,000 gallons of water per acre, depending on soil type. So that's a lot less erosion that's gonna be happening, uh, water going offsite, um, and you're gonna be a lot happier with your, your results of when you follow those directions. So there's a misconception out there that the 5% uh, is by weight or volumetrically. We wanna make sure that we're emphasizing that that's 5% organic matter by weight. You get extremely different test results if you try to apply that number volumetrically, which is volumetrically feels more intuitive for some people, but unfortunately it can mean a widely different amount of compost that you apply. And people are generally not as satisfied with the results they get when it's volumetrically. It's, it's too much compost. So to calculate it, you need bulk density and the percent organic matter of both the native soil and the compost you select. So here's the formula that you can go through. We're gonna create an automatic calculator on our website to try to make this easier for you. And we're gonna provide these slides after the talk so that you can go through and look at this formula to make sure that you're calculating 5% organic matter correctly to get the results that you want. So we also have up on our website, other people's specifications. These are different state DOTs who already specify STA certified compost and believe in it. Uh, underneath each one of those links is more detail about the language they put into that specification. We also in this effort with the EPA region three grant have put a lot more effort into finding out what other states do. So we have about 50 more specifications to add to this list. So be looking in the next week or two as we get those up on our website. We also have a document where we did research in the past, finding out how much compost is actually utilized by each state. And that's also up on our website with some examples. Donald did an excellent job talking about his case studies for North Carolina. In this document, we have some case studies around the United States uh, for other people's experiences. So how do you find STA certified compost? We wanna make that easy. There's a link here at the bottom of this page where you can uh, access the list as well as the map of all of these compost facilities in your area. We're always increasing this list. And the best way to increase this list of folks is to go to the compost manufacturer near you, ask that they join the program and we'll work with them to get them into the program. Uh, we're always working on improving things. So we have just started working with a programmer get our database up into the uh, 21st century, and we're gonna work to make this map searchable and make it a lot easier for you to find what you need. So we also appreciate any feedback you have on what you're looking for in order to do that. All right, so now we have the wonderful Greg Evanulo who is gonna help us out about phosphorus.
Thank you very much, uh, Hillary, and good morning, everyone. And today, what I'd like to address is the question, should phosphorus limit compost use? Uh, we know this is an important issue because when compost is applied as normally recommended, uh, phosphorus in the soil increases to very high levels. Uh, some, oops, let me, uh, okay. Uh, so we know this is a, uh, an important issue because when phosphorus compost is applied, phosphorus increases to very high levels. And these levels uh, may uh, result in movement of phosphorus to surface water uh, where it can impair uh, surface water. Uh, before I um, uh, talk to you about a uh, field research site in which we can demonstrate the use of phosphorus in compost, I'd like to look at, first of all, at the phosphorus cycle as a reminder of uh, the interactions of phosphorus from compost in the soil. So when we apply compost as either animal manures or biosolids or plant residues, the majority of the compost in the soil or in the, in the, uh, or the majority of the phosphorus in the compost is in that material as organic phosphorus, but this quickly mineralizes or decomposes to a very soluble source of phosphorus uh, uh, known as orthophosphate and, and shown by these two uh, compounds. It is this source of phosphorus that is very readily available for plant uptake. Now, once this phosphorus is in the soil, it has interactions with very various soil components, such as the mineral surfaces of clays and iron oxides and carbonates. So we can have the great majority of soluble phosphorus being held uh, very tightly by these soils. In addition, uh, there are uh, metals in the soil, particularly iron and aluminum, which can precipitate with such phosphorus and reduce its availability. Some of these metals, such as iron and aluminum, are also added to some compost, particularly those that, that uh, result in biosolids composting. Uh, so that the phosphorus in biosolids compost, for example, is much less soluble. Now the transport of this source of phosphorus uh, can occur to some extent by leaching, although this is usually very minor, except in very coarse sandy soils. The majority of the loss occurs through runoff and erosion, either by directly by soluble phosphorus or that phosphorus that's bound to particulate matter. Let's now look to a research study in which I'll demonstrate the use of compost uh, on phosphorus interactions in the soil. For five years in Orange, Virginia at Virginia Tech Experiment Station, uh, we applied uh, uh, various organic amendments uh, to a Fauquier silk silky clay loam soil having 8% slope, which could be subject to much runoff and, uh, and erosion. The treatments that, we, that I'll show you that we compared were control in which no amendment was added throughout the five years. Uh, all the nutrients for the plants were based on residual in the soil. We also applied fertilizer according to soil test needs and then three sources of organic wastes, a poultry litter, a poultry litter waste, uh, yard waste compost, and a biosolids wood chip compost based on their nitrogen availabilities and the nitrogen requirements of the crops. And the crops in this rotation included a number of vegetable and agronomic crops. Let's first look at the phosphorus contents and, and rates that we applied. So for these organic amendments, the poultry litter, the poultry litter compost, and the biosolids compost, we see that the poultry litter and the biosolids compost had by far the highest concentration of total phosphorus. There was significantly less in phos total phosphorus in the poultry litter compost due to dilution of the poultry litter by the, uh, by the yard waste that was blended. 
So, so these are the total amounts of to, uh, in percent of phosphorus in these various products. Now, if we look at water extractable phosphorus, which is an important criteria for its potential solubility and runoff, we see that the greatest amount of water extractable phosphorus was in the poultry litter and significantly less in the poultry litter compost, uh, largely due to dilution, but also probably to other binding properties of this compost. Surprisingly, the biosolids compost, which had the highest amount of total phosphorus, had only a scant amount of water extractable phosphorus. And this is due to the presence of these metals such as iron and aluminum, which are found naturally in biosolids or added in the wastewater treatment plant to bind phosphorus. So we can see that going, uh, basing uh, uh, phosphorus uh, application on total phosphorus alone may cause somewhat of a problem due to the differences in water extractable phosphorus. The amounts of total phosphorus that were added to this site over the five years included 72 kilograms per hectare with the fertilizer, and that was according to soil test needs. Uh, when the poultry litter was applied, it, uh, we uh, applied about five times the recommended amount in the poultry litter uh, when we applied the poultry litter according to the nitrogen basis. And when the composts were applied, between 15 and 20 times as much phosphorus as would be required according to soil tests uh, was applied. Again, because we're applying these materials which have lower nitrogen availabilities on a nitrogen available basis. And so we see this, these very high amounts of phosphorus that are applied could potentially lead to a water impairment problem. So what were the results after five years of phosphorus in the soil? These are soil test results in the top two inches. First of all, using a common soil test procedure in the Eastern United States known as the male three phosphorus. In our control soils, we had very small amount of phosphorus uh, as no phosphorus was added during the lifetime of the study. When we applied phosphorus according to the soil test needs in fertilizer, we raised to the appropriate soil test level, the amount of phosphorus in the soil. Poultry litter also increased phosphorus in male, extractable by malic 3 to a similar concentration. But remember when the poultry litter compost and the biosolids uh, compost were added, that tremendously high uh, rates of phosphorus were added, and this is reflected in the very high extractable phosphorus according to Malik 3. It's important to know that many soil test labs and some environmental labs have what they have identified as a critical concentration of Malik 3 phosphorus in the soil for environmental uh, effects. Therefore, uh, anything greater than 127 parts per million uh, might result in some movement of phosphorus and impairment. And we could see that the poultry litter compost and the biosolids compost were about double the, the, the critical concentration, posing a potential problem. Let's now look at water extractable phosphorus from these soils. It was the lowest as expected in the control soil, uh, about twice as high in the fertilized soil, and about four times, three to four times as high in the poultry litter amended soil. And we're was uh, many times, over 20 times as high in, in that soil when the poultry litter compost is applied annually. For the same uh, amount, nearly the same amount of total or extract phosphor, uh, male three extractable phosphorus in the soil. However, the biosolids compost gave greatly lower amounts of water extractable phosphorus again, likely due to the high amounts of iron in this product. So this is an example of all compost, even those having same extractable soil test phosphorus may not be the same because of other factors like uh, phosphorus binding metals. So in this study, we also 
conducted some simulated rainfall in order to generate infiltration and runoff and look at the potential for phosphorus moving from this site. Uh, this is an illustration showing our rainfall simulation, tarps, rainfall on this about two inches an hour. For each experimental plot replicated four times, we rained on this site two, uh, at the rate of two inches an hour until uh, runoff began to occur. Then we measured the amount of uh, runoff that occurred in the next uh, 30 minutes to an hour. And also then we're able to calculate the amount of water that infiltrated, the amount of water that ran off, and we were able to measure in the runoff composition of that runoff water. So here we see uh, the infiltration and runoff from these sites. Uh, the control study uh, where no amendments was added had the uh, greatest amount of runoff and the least amount of infiltration. As we move to the fertilizer, there was uh, uh, not really a significant effect, even though there was a slightly absolute increase in the amount of infiltration, potentially small uh, re uh, reduction in, in runoff. Uh, and, but as we move then to the poultry litter and the biosolids compost, we saw a significant increase in infiltration above the control. And finally, with the poultry litter compost, we found the greatest amount of infiltration with the least amount of runoff. So recall that it's not just the concentration of phosphorus in the soil, but the potential for transport through runoff that, that uh, infers the risk of phosphorus loss. So we looked at the runoff phosphorus losses by analyzing the runoff water and multiplying it times the volume of water that left the site. And we could see, perhaps surprisingly to you, uh, not necessarily to us soil scientists who understand these treatments, that the control study itself, the control treatment itself, had the greatest amount of total phosphorus that left the site and the biosolids compost with a great, large, greatly large amount of total phosphorus uh, did not lose significantly more. And in fact, the poultry litter compost, which had the greatest amount of water extractable phosphorus, lost the least amount of total phosphorus from the site. Uh, in, in terms of dissolved orthophosphorus, there was no difference in grams per hectare of that leaving the site. So why did this occur? We know that when we apply organic amendments and we're increasing organic matter and total carbon, and we can see from this graph that as we increase total carbon and organic matter runoff decreased. So at the highest rate of total organic carbon, which was occurred from the poultry litter compost, we had the least amount of runoff and the most amount of runoff from the control and the fertilizer plots. So in summary, uh, we can add amendments to our compost feedstock or our compost such as iron and aluminum, which can reduce phosphorus solubility. And by simply adding large amounts of compost to the soil uh, and increasing organic matter, we can increase infiltration, reduce runoff, increase water holding capacity, and that reduces the loss of runoff water and associated components such as phosphorus. So uh, thank you for your attention. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Hillary. All right, thank you, Greg. And next we're gonna hear from Dr. Brett Fawcett. Awesome, thank you, uh, thank you, Hillary. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning into the, to the workshop today. We know your, your time is, is precious, so we really appreciate you, you tuning in. Uh, I'm Britt Fawcett, I'm the Director of Research and Technical Services for Filtrex. Uh, I've been working with compost-based BMPs for uh, just about 25 years now in my, in my um, combined time in academia at the University of Georgia and now with Filtrex International. And, one of the many things that I do is work with uh, a lot of you all in developing specifications, both at the national and the state level. And so I'm really excited and pleased to see a lot of, of familiar uh, faces and, and names out there. So 
I'm gonna, uh, oh, Hillary, you have the slides uh, next. <laughs> I always like to start with a bit of an outline of how I'm how I'll move through and, and one thing I'm going to do if you'll permit me is I'm actually going to turn off my video I'm going to wave to you I'll come back in a moment at the end, but just to control bandwidth. Um, I do like to start with a bit of an outline <clears throat> of how we'll move through the uh, the bulk of my time with you. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about stormwater management because I think it really lays the foundation of, uh, of why we're using compost and how it fits in. I'll talk a bit about the what, why, and the how compost functions in these applications or BMPs, best management practices. But I'm really going to focus on two, uh, two types uh, of applications, compost the research uh, behind compost filter socks and how they perform. Um, <clears throat> and then also followed by compost blankets. Again, some of the key research on the performance of how these things work and, and really in relation to other types of BMPs. One of the key take home messages for both of these I want you to, want you to think about is really compost filter socks are really treatment for runoff and stormwater. And your blankets are really your prevention of runoff or stormwater generation. Next slide, Hillary. Uh, I, I think Frank uh, showed you a version of this slide. I'm, I'm going to share it again because it's honestly, it's one of my all time favorite slides. And I think in, it shows in a very efficient and very effective way what happens when we change our land use patterns uh, from natural systems like you see on the left to greater land disturbance, more impervious surface and urbanization as you move to the right. And basically what's happening is happening is we're basically breaking the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. And you see that in the color coordination and what we get, nature does a very effective job at, at minimizing uh, storm water as well as pollution. And when we move towards greater development, each one of those things gets diminished, whether it's evapotranspiration, uh, movement of water down into the soil profile <clears throat> or uh, recharge of our groundwaters. And you see the red really begins to creep in quite a bit as we as we remove natural systems, biomass, rootstock, canopy, grasses, all these things that work together. Um, <clears throat> and you see two things here. You see the red, which is really depicted as stormwater or runoff volume. And I've typed in pollutant load because there's tons of studies that now show the more stormwater runoff we have, the concomitant uh, increase in pollutant loading that's transported in this runoff to our uh, receiving surface water bodies. So there's really, there's, there's really two things uh, at play here that, that we can do. We don't necessarily have to go back to nature, but we have two choices. And, and really these often work together. We can try to minimize the surface runoff or we can seek to try to treat it. In many cases, we need to do both. Uh, next slide. Uh, I realize that almost none of us work on a watershed scale and almost all of us work on a site scale. And so the decisions that we make in our professional lives on a daily basis, this is where we're going to have the greatest impact by the BMPs we choose, the designs we implement, uh, how we inspect sites, how we maintain sites. All of that really mostly occurs at the, at the site level. Um, there's another reason why I'm sharing this slide with you. And if you, if you look at the percentages here at the site level for the hydrologic values, they're almost identical to what you see on the watershed scale. And what happens as uh, not we here on the, at the workshop, but the collective we, when we develop sites, generally what happens is we'll, uh, we'll clear off the vegetation, scrape off that organic matter and topsoil down to the subsoil, and we never really replace it. That can take thousands of years to generate in some cases. Uh, but this is where compost begins to fit into the equation. We can actually replace the, the hydrologic performance of that organic matter and topsoil layer uh, with a compost blanket. Uh, you look at that arrow that's pointing down, 35% that's infiltrated. Uh, we know this is a, a natural process, what we call biofiltration or natural filtration of stormwater. With a compost filter berm or a compost filter sock, we don't have to have infiltration to get that occurrence now. We can actually put that above ground in the flow path and we can deploy it nearly anywhere we, we need to on a site because we know in developed sites, runoff is going to be greater and pollutants are going to be greater. So if we can deploy these things where we need them the most, that's critically important. Uh, if you look at the seven key design elements of low impact development or green infrastructure, 
You'll notice that squarely four of these can be addressed pretty effectively by the use of compost blankets and compost filter socks. Uh, and I've highlighted, I've, bold, I've put in bold uh, highlight which ones I'm referring to. So infiltration, compost blankets can greatly in, uh, uh, influence and improve infiltration on disturbed soils. Uh, they can restore natural evaporation rates. We actually design surface roughness right into the compost blanket. I'm gonna talk about each one of these in more detail momentarily. And then finally, biofiltration, and that's the use of a compost filter berm or a filter sock to get natural form of filtration. And, and really, some of you may have heard of this concept of biomimicry, which is innovation inspired by nature. And this is really where the, the, the design and the application of compost-based BMPs has really come from. We look at these natural systems and how they work and how they perform and operate, and we're utilizing compost to mimic those systems. Uh, next slide. If you're relatively new to these these, these, these practices, you may be somewhat surprised to know that basically every federal agency or national organization that has the ability to specify or create a guidance document for compost-based BMPs has done so. Uh, the US EPA's National Menu of BMPs, the USDA NRCS, the Army Corps of Engineers, the original one was the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. As Hillary mentioned, the US Composting Council also has specifications. And really at least one jurisdictional state agency, if not both in all 50 states, whether it be the transportation department or the state uh, EPA or DNR, uh, depending on the, the name of that agency. Uh, next slide. So let's talk compost for a minute. <clears throat> so all of the applications that I'm gonna talk about use either one or two types of compost. And they're both visually depicted here. The one on the left is what we often refer to as a, a filtration media or a biofiltration media. You can see it's a very coarse media. Uh, it's designed for optimum filtration of pollutants as well as passive flow of water. And then the, the media on the right <clears throat> is what we use for compost erosion control blankets. It's also coarse, but not quite as coarse. And it's designed for optimum water absorption as well as plant growth. And at this point, you may be looking at these and thinking, wow, neither one of these look like compost that I'm used to buying or utilizing. And if you're thinking that, ding, 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 that is a key take home message. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the compost that we often buy in a bagged product at your local garden center or use in our gardens, is actually a low quality compost for these applications. And it's only because of the particle size, okay? That's the, that's the key thing. So if you utilize that type of compost in these applications, you will get diminished performance. And, and all the information I'm about to share with you actually does not apply, okay? It's all based around the development of, of compost that you see here. Next slide. So here's a, a, a big list of uh, compost-based stormwater management practices. So these are all generic terms. The ones on the left are construction activity stormwater management, uh, AKA erosion and sediment control. The ones on the right are post-construction stormwater management. <clears throat> now I've highlighted the ones in red font that use this very coarse compost media, uh, the filter media. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by talking about those. Uh, and generally in compost filter berm and sock applications. And then I'm gonna move to the compost blanket type applications. Uh, next slide, Hillary. Give you a bit of a visual representation of what uh, a lot of these look like in the field from utilized for slope interruption. Join the meeting. Uh, check dam applications, inlet protection, uh, utilizing it along, a, <clears throat> excuse me, along a roadside, um, utilizing it uh, in uh, building up um, a uh, pyramid configuration or stacking the compost filter socks to increase design capacity for, for much larger drainage areas uh, or much longer slopes you see in the upper right hand corner. Uh, next slide. I want to I want to hone in on the particle size aspect for a moment because it really is critical and I know that I've already touched on it. Um, but really the, the design, it, sometimes it sounds funny when I say this, um, even to myself, but a lot of research has gone on to develop and create the optimum particle size distribution for these, for the compost, for these applications. And I think it really is depicted here for compost filter sock. 
Uh, if you look at this slide, <clears throat> if you look down at the bottom, this is in inches. So a quarter inch going to two inches in size. And as those particles get larger, that flow through rate, that water flow through rate increases, the filtration ability goes down. As, the, as you cinch down on the particle sizes and move to the left and you get uh, really 100% below a quarter inch, and this may resemble this bagged product that I referenced earlier, what happens is that flow through rate goes down, filtration ability goes up to the point where when you're on the left-hand side of that scale, you're just blocking everything. There's, there's no filtration, there's no flow through, it's just a, a solid barrier. That is not what we want. Consequently, that's what a straw waddle does. Consequently, that's what a sill fence does. We're looking for something more in the middle where we can really have um, a, a passive biofiltration system where we get both of these. And the concept behind developing these and designing these is actually the same as developing a water filter in your refrigerator, your sink, a pool, even an air filter in your HVAC system or your automobile. You basically, as you cinch down on what we call apertures or pore spaces, flow through rate decreases, filtration goes up, you make those pore spaces bigger or apertures, flow increases, uh, filtration diminishes. The concept is, is exactly the same. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> this, where, this is where it gets even more interesting and, and fun from my perspective and, and really makes compost really unique in these applications. There's really three unique and different ways that compost socks and biofiltration media work in biofiltration. The first one is physical, and actually it's not all that unique, and I've already been talking about that. By manipulating the particle sizes, what we do is we create a variety of pore spaces. What that does is it, it slows down flow, doesn't dam it, doesn't block it, but it slows it. And through that process, we get sediment deposition occurring. We also get filtration of sediment within the matrix of the system. Here's where it gets interesting. There's a chemical component, and I don't mean we're adding chemicals to it, but <clears throat> we know that a compost material has a, 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 per particle, has an extremely high surface area that has the ability to sorb or adsorb some of the key soluble forms of pollutants in our stormwater. And, and ammonium nitrogen and a variety of metals are good examples of these. This is actually the same concept behind how uh, activated carbon works. Uh, in your drinking water filters. It's just that the particle, the, the surface area is not nearly as high as, as uh, per particle as activated carbon is, but the, but the process is, is exactly the same. There's a biological component as well. And we know that a mature uh, high quality compost has both a high population density as well as diversity of beneficial bacteria that can degrade and transform some of the very pollutants that we're trapping within the system here. So uh, we get a, a bit of bioremediation going on in C2 here in the field. And it's the exact same concept that we attribute to bioretention systems, rain gardens, and even constructed wetlands. There's a fourth one here <clears throat> that I have not typed into the slide because it's more of an option and that is phytoremediation. And we can choose certain plant materials and seed them or plant them into the sock or the berm to uptake specific pollutants into their biomass through their roots, thereby taking it out of the flow path and increasing the longevity or functional longevity of these systems. Uh, next slide, Hillary. So I'm gonna share some research with you. Uh, this is a research project that was conducted at the USDA Ag Research Service um, uh, outside of Washington, DC at the research headquarters in, in Beltsville, Maryland. It's been published in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation comparing the performance uh, of a compost filter sock to silt fence for suspended solids and turbidity reduction. You can see the percentages there in the table. Uh, next. A similar study, this is done at San Diego State University. Do you um, a large scale ASTM test method specifically designed for erosion control materials and best management practices. They looked at the total sediment reduction of sediment barriers in this particular study. Uh, you can see the removal efficiencies or removal rates for compost filter socks compared to straw wattles. Next slide. And then another study. Uh, these are done, uh, this is done at the University of Georgia, also published in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation, looking at the total suspended solids reduction of a variety of, of uh, sediment barriers made of natural material. So here they looked at compost filter socks, uh, wood chip berms, as well as straw bales. 
uh, and you can see the significant performance difference uh, between the other types of organic materials relative to, uh, to the compost filter socks. Now, this is done on, on large scale field test plots. Now, one of the things I wanna pause here and talk about is across these three studies, using different methodologies, different soil types, meaning different sediment types, different concentrations, loading rates, rainfall intensities, flows, we're, all, we're seeing a definite trend of roughly 80% removal efficiency across these studies for compost filter socks, uh, no matter where the study took place. Uh, next slide. So the USDA um, uh, did a, a follow-up study to look at compost filter socks really as more of a, what I consider it to be a true biofilter. So uh, lots of studies showing its uh, effectiveness or its performance to target sediment and to target it quite well. Um, <clears throat> but to move beyond that, because we know in the research literature tells us that the total pollutant load in the post-construction uh, environment can be up to 80%. Uh, can be up to 80% pollutants in their soluble form. So not attached to particulate, not attached to sediment. So utilizing just a sediment control practice to target pollutants in the post-construction stormwater environment just doesn't make sense unless there's data that, that proves otherwise. Uh, and so this is part of the intention of this study and the results have been published jointly in the, in the Journal of Environmental Quality and Journal of Soil and Water Con Conservation. They did look at suspended solids and turbidity here as well. But the rest of these pollutants are in the soluble form uh, from nitrogen species, phosphorus species, total phosphorus. Uh, they looked at um, harmful bacteria in the form of total coliform and E. coli. They looked at a variety of metals, copper, cadmium, chromium, nickel, lead, and zinc, and then petroleum, hy petroleum hydrocarbons in the form of uh, motor oil and diesel fuel. So these are the removal efficiencies or removal rates for each of these uh, pollutants. Uh, in a post-construction stormwater context. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm most excited, uh, one, one of the developments I'm most excited about in this area is the recent uh, development of all natural uh, fiber and biodegradable meshes to go with the compost filter socks. From my very first workshop that I hosted, um, when I came uh, into the private sector to talk about some of these BMPs, probably the first question I got was, really cool application, Do you, does the mesh also come in a biodegradable option? And at that point, it did not. Um, and it's something that uh, we've been striving and working towards for quite some time. And now, now we do have two uh, options we commonly see in the marketplace. One is made out of an all natural cotton. The other is made out of an all natural wood fiber. Um, that lasts a little bit longer and is a little more durable than the, than the cotton is. But we see folks um, uh, choosing this or wanting to move to this for a variety of reasons. We see a lot of transportation departments actually not just minimizing, but outright uh, beginning to prevent the use of, of BMPs that have plastics. Uh, there's quite a few states that are, that are moving in that direction. Uh, and this helps them to, to get there as well. But there's a lot of different reasons why folks are, are choo choosing this, whether it's the reduction of uh, petroleum-based products, elimination of microplastics in the environment, obviously part of the theme today, but reduction of materials going to landfills, minimization, or reducing labor costs to remove the product. There's obviously nothing to, to remove at the end of the project. Uh, preventing wildlife entrapment or landscape entanglement, uh, or just really utilizing materials and systems and BMPs that are that are compatible with the permanent landscape or the natural landscape. But uh, I will say probably the biggest reason I see folks moving to this is is now there is no removal cost, um, which which can be a high labor cost. There's no disposal, so there's nothing to take to the landfill, and thereby greatly minimizing the overall life cycle cost of these systems. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to transition here. Now I'm going to talk about the, the erosion control uh, blanket applications, and it utilizes this media that you see on the right. Uh, thanks, Hillary. <laughs> um, so one of the things I want to say right off the bat with uh, a lot of the research behind compost uh, blankets is, um, and, and dare I say it's probably one of the most uh, research erosion control BMPs uh, that's in use today, frankly. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that we found that it works so well for erosion is its ability to minimize and prevent 
runoff. And I'm going to talk about that here in, um, as, I, as I talk about the four key elements down here. So a compost blanket is really designed to do four key things. Number one, it, uh, you, put it, you squarely put it across the whole soil surface, covering up the entire bare soil. It's generally about two inches uh, thick. It's not tilled in, it's not incorporated, it's just applied to the soil surface. And by doing that, we actually prevent the first stage of erosion from occurring, and that is splash erosion, or otherwise known as soil particle dislodgement. So when these raindrops hit a bare soil, it's almost like natural tillage. It just loosens everything up, breaks up soil aggregates, um, it's not a water quality issue, but it creates the optimum conditions for transport of sediment to become a water quality issue. If rainfall keeps occurring, then it'll wash those sediments away. So we're preventing that first stage from occurring here. Number two, and this is one of the key take home messages, these things are natural mega sponges. They absorb so much rainfall, they hold it there at the, at the soil surface because of a high degree of porosity and organic matter. And now, we, now it allows it to slowly infiltrate back into the soil below and uh, evaporate back up into the atmosphere above. And now you can see conceptually how we're actually restoring that natural water cycle through the use of these compost blankets. I'm gonna give you some data in a moment. It's the small particles that we design into the system that provide this. Number three, it's the large particles that do this. And so once runoff should occur, and in many cases it actually doesn't with these applications, uh, these large particles are the surface roughness we're designing right into the BMP, the large particles. And what it does is it slows down runoff once it occurs. It makes it less erosive. It makes it less destructive. It allows for pockets of infiltration to occur as runoff moves uh, across that, uh, that slope uh, or across that field. Uh, and, and it really just, it also not only minimizes runoff, but also erosion in that process. And as I identified earlier, uh, surface roughness is actually a BMP in and of itself uh, in both erosion control and post-construction stormwater design. And of course, and everybody probably gets this intuitively, compost is, is great for vegetation establishment and sustainability. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, this is a research project that I worked on at the University of Georgia, published in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation. And in this study, we found on average, a compost blanket could absorb about 84% of a four inch rainfall event. So think about that for a moment. Probably 95% of the events that we're gonna see, quarter inch, half inch, three quarter inch, one inch, it's gonna absorb all or nearly all of that rainfall. And if you're absorbing all that rainfall, no runoff, no runoff, no erosion no runoff, no transport of pollutants of any type. And, uh, and, and Greg, and this is part of what Greg was talking about earlier in his presentation uh, as well. So if you think about that, it's not just managing stormwater on a site, which is part of what LID and green infrastructure is about. It's actually preventing it from occurring in the first place, which is pretty key. Uh, next slide. Here's four university studies that all bear this out, two from the University of Georgia, one from uh, University of Connecticut, and one from Iowa State University showing about nearly 50% to 90% volumetric reduction of stormwater runoff when, when deploying a compost blanket on, uh, on a field test site. Next. We're actually seeing this also play out in pollutant transport scenarios as well. So here's uh, four uh, university studies from top to bottom. This is Texas A&M, two from the University of Georgia and one from Iowa State University. And in these studies, they compared a compost blanket to the way that, uh, to a conventional vegetation or seeding practice that we, that we commonly see in the industry today. And so these are all uh, percent reduction values in and what the compost showed versus the conventional practice. And I put in parentheses in each study uh, what those were, seed and fertilizer, hydro mulches, and seed and, top, and topsoil. So um, just to give you an example, um, in Mukhtar et al. 2004, a compost blanket reduced total nitrogen loading in the runoff by 88% compared to seed and fertilizer. 45% for nitrate nitrogen, 87% for phosphorus species, and 99% of total sediment transport. So basically what we're seeing here is two trends. One, we're seeing the trend uh, across all of these studies, but we're also seeing it across pollutants. And one of the chief reasons why is just their ability to absorb so much rainfall, thereby minimizing runoff and thereby also minimizing transport of pollutants as well. Next. 
Uh, last uh, slide on data, I promise. Um, this is a study and it's probably the largest um, comparative study for erosion control practices uh, that's been published in a scientific journal that, that I'm aware of. Uh, it was conducted, conducted at San Diego State University using ASTM standard methods uh, for erosion control practices published in the Journal of Environmental Quality. They utilized a two to one slope. And you can see here the different practices that were evaluated, compost blankets, uh, single net straw blanket, single net excelsior fiber blanket, double net straw, double net coconut fiber, a tack of fire and a polyacrylamide. And really in the, in, the, in the storm that they use is a design storm they use for this method. They use two inches per hour for 20 minutes, four inches per hour for, for the next 20 minutes, and then six inches per hour for the last 20 minutes for, for a total duration of an hour in a high intensity environment. And the point of the method is to find failure points of these practices. And, and it did do that. And you'll, you'll see that in the results here that the compost blanket outperformed all these other industry erosion control materials and practices, even more than the previous conventional wisdom that a double net coconut fiber blanket is the highest performing uh, erosion control product on the market. Um, pretty, uh, pr pretty interesting and pretty exciting uh, results. And we're seeing a, a lot of this information being implemented now with engineering departments as well as transportation departments uh, across the country. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna transition back to Hillary, but I wanted to leave you as we do with this quote from a dear friend and, and a mentor of mine, Dr. Jordan, uh, comes from one of his books. Uh, I'll let you read it, but I thought it was pretty precedent for the, the topic that we're, that we're discussing today. Uh, and also that he, he wrote this about 50 years ago as well. Uh, thank you, Hillary. Thank you all. All right, thanks Britt and thanks to all of our speakers. So I wanna remind everybody our take home statements are compost soaked in water, compost overall over the life of the product costs less and the US Composting Council. And as Britt said, a lot of other great organizations have template specifications. So next step, uh, we're gonna answer questions in the chat. Terry has been uh, tabulating all of those questions you've been asking. Some of those have been answered in the chat. And I want to remind you that we have state-specific breakout meetings next week. Please bring others to the table for the meeting. We'll answer questions. We'll find out from you if you're ready for us to help you facilitate developing specifications or modifying specifications for your area. Or if you need, like Donald mentioned, his aha moment came after there was a, a local research study. It was North Carolina State University for him. It would be a different university for you to do a study to compare BMPs for you in your area to look at a trouble site that you have and see how compost performs on that. So we're gonna have those breakout meetings next week. Uh, we are at the end of our meeting and if anyone is available to stay later, we will continue answering those questions in the chat. So Carrie, will you take it from here? Uh, yes, uh, thanks Hillary and uh, thanks to everyone who's hung in there. It's been a great webinar. Uh, both Don and Greg have actually typed their answers already to the questions that were submitted to them. So thank you to that. Uh, Britt, there was one question that came in for you uh, about how the blankets hold up under uh, with more frequent and larger rain events. Uh, so that, that that idea of a, you know, that blanket holding all the water from a relatively small rainfall, uh, if our rainfalls are coming more frequently, and they're already saturated, uh, that's obviously gonna have an impact. Uh, yeah, so good question. So yeah, what I'll say is um, most of these studies that I shared with you used um, high accumulation events to evaluate compost blankets. Um, and so what we see is, is um, as I mentioned in one of the slides, 84% um, absorption for even a four inch rain event, which is a, a pretty significant event. And that occurred within an hour, not 24 hours, one hour. Um, that's pretty high intensity and accumulation. What I will say is once you begin to get above that, and we've seen in some of that ASTM testing too, is um, uh, it begins to, uh, you begin to see uh, surface rilling in the compost. 
Um, and, uh, and it begins to shed in that way. And you begin to see that erosion that way. Obviously no, nothing is really designed to hold up uh, under uh, really high accumulation events. Um, the other thing I'll, I will say, and I've seen this in a lot of these comparative studies is in a compost blanket where you may see some of that rilling in, in a very high accumulation event like that or high intensity event. <clears throat> and uh, when you're utilizing a rolled erosion control product, uh, you often may not see that, but it's because the, that's all occurring underneath and that does occur and actually occurs much uh, sooner or much quicker during these uh, lower intensity and lower accumulation events. And, and in fact, in the, in the field, we would never go back and, and roll up one of these blankets and see what's going on underneath. Whereas uh, with a compost blanket, at some point you would potentially see that. So it's a good question. Thank you. And before we go to our next question, I want to say again, a big thank you to the EPA Region 3 for giving us this grant, the Compost Research and Education Foundation, to do this work with you all now. Yeah, uh, I guess we have time for maybe one or two more questions. We are kind of running late, uh, but uh, Britt, there was a question just came in about uh, what keeps compost from sliding down the hill under high intensity. If you're on a slope and you're getting good rainfall, why doesn't that compost end up at the bottom of the hill? It is organic, uh, it floats. Yeah, good question. So um, one, of the th one of the first things we'll do is we'll um, roughen the soil surface. Um, to help uh, to help it stay there, um, and that actually helps quite a bit. But the other thing we've seen, and I and I know this may be a little counterintuitive that that if it's not stitched together, that it would all float or move. But actually, what we see is is just natural real and interreal erosion begin to occur at these very high accumulation intensity events, um, rather than the whole thing moving or floating. Um, and, I, and I've seen that in, in quite a few high intensity duration studies, even on steep slopes. Now, the one caveat I will say is when you do get to steeper slopes, like above two to one, then, we'll, uh, then we'll, we will begin to combine a, a very minimal um, natural uh, net underneath uh, to give it more surface roughness. It's a good question. Great, thank you. And can we also have Greg uh, verbally answer some of the questions that you've been answering in the chat? I know that um, P is a big concern for some folks. Sure, I uh, need to go back to the chat to recall. So, um, so there's a, I know one question was about um, phosphorus movement in bioretention cells. And can we use sort of the same uh, basis, scientific basis for uh, predicting that as we would in a soil that's amended with compost. And we, there's been research, there has been research on phosphorus uh, movement and in bioretention cells though, there tends to be uh, great potential for, or more potential for phosphorus leaching through the cell because bioretention cells tend to be 85 to 90% sand as opposed to a, a, a subsoil in, in a soil. Even in our coastal plain regions, our subsoils tend to have significant amounts of clay. So there's potential for leaching losses through a bioretention cell uh, uh, that may be greater than, uh, than runoff because the bioretention cell is designed to collect all of the uh, water flow from a uh, from sort of a small watershed and funnel it through uh, the medium uh, in order to clean it. But one can um, one can uh, mitigate those potential phosphorus movements by uh, by making your medium more phosphorus binding. And I mentioned the use of uh, water treatment resi residuals or steel slag or, or other sort of metal uh, waste products that would increase the binding for phosphorus. And we see a variety of bioretention cells, some that act as sinks 
of uh, for phosphorus in some of that active sources, and that's usually associated with the, uh, the metal content of them. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. I want to again give a big thank you to the EPA Region 3 for giving the Compost Research and Education Foundation this grant. Uh, this has been also the U.S. Composting Council contributing, and we've had a lot of great speakers, Greg, Britt, um, Donald, Frank, uh, Carrie, myself. Thank you all for being a part of this, and thank you all for attending. We, we really appreciate it, and we hope that we can solve some of the issues that you're seeing, and we hope that this webinar has been helpful. We look forward to seeing you next week in the breakout meetings. Take care. <laughs>